everybody. Yet another car today from the good people at Retro Classic Car up in North Yorkshire. Now, the particularly eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed the fact that this is not a retro or classic car. It is instead a 2017 Chevrolet Camaro SS 50th Anniversary Edition. And I'm driving this for two very good reasons. Number one, I can. And number two, I've just come off the back of driving a 1968 big block Camaro, the daddy. And that was quite an experience. Now, when I was about to get into this, the lovely Sam, who's part of the father and son team that run Retro Classic Cars, said to me, James, you ever driven a, a new Camaro before? And I said, yeah, I have. He said, oh, what do you think of it? And I said, it was crap. Very, very rarely have I seen in a man's eyes the sudden realization that he might have done something absolutely awful. Because you see, what you may not realize is that when car dealers give me a car for review, they give me a car for review. I'm not here to just promote their business and say simply nice things. I'm here to give you an honest opinion of this car. Now, the old Camaro was a difficult thing to drive, noisy, loud, far too soft. But I can forgive that car because it's 50 odd years old now. It looks great and it sounds great. And that's really all you ever ask of a classic vehicle. This one has no excuses whatsoever. Now it is nearly 50 years on from that other car. I think in the last video, actually this is 2019, I'm wrong, it's 2017, but that doesn't really matter. This is the current crop of Camaro. Now fortunately, all of the other Camaros that I've driven have been rental cars. They have been V6 convertibles. They have been the least sporty Camaro you can possibly imagine. This is the SS. This is the sporty one, the meaty one. It's not the top dog. It's not a ZL1 or a ZL1, I suppose we should really call it, or anything like that. It's simply the good one. Now up front we have a 6.2 litre Chevrolet LT1 engine, the exact same power plant as you'd find in the old C7 Corvette Stingray. And it's a truly great engine, absolutely brilliant, comes from a very, very long line of Chevrolet small blocks and in the Corvette it certainly does the business, but does it in this? Let's find out. Yes, it does. Moves the car along at a reasonable pace, even from essentially no RPM. We'll find out just how well it does at higher RPM as soon as she's warmed up. Now it's easy to tell how warm it is from the bevy of gauges here in the central digital instrument cluster. And I have to say that the Camaro is already winning some brownie points for me because this is a much better display than in the previous Camaros that I have driven. It actually feels decent and modern. There's quite a bit about this interior that is simply terrible, horrible scratchy plastics, and a, uh, a leather-ish, it probably is leather, little support for your arm, but that's put on top of a door card that's so high, you're kind of doing that, that. This is not a comfortable position. And as you can probably tell, there's not a lot of glass in this car. It's not as hard to place on the road as I thought it might have been because you've actually got a pretty decent view of that bonnet. I kind of like the shape of the current Camaro. It's, not a car I hate at all to look at, but I do think the Mustang does a much, much better job of looking equal parts modern and retro. This just looks awkward from quite a few different angles. You have, as is obligatory these days, a number of different driving modes. And in tour, it's actually reasonably civil. These are not brilliant back roads, but the suspension has a reasonable amount of control. The car's pretty easy and the steering's got a nice weight to it and it's actually surprisingly darty. But I'm not here to see how good this car is as a cruiser. I'm here to see what it's like when it's faced with the toughest test you could possibly give any brutish muscle car, a British back road. So I'm gonna shift the transmission over into manual, start doing things myself, and we'll see how she fares. Now that is a pretty good action. I've got to say, I am. I am surprised, Chevrolet at you. I am really surprised. That is a nice feel. The little lever itself is not so great, and the gear shifts are embarrassingly slow. This is more than likely the eight-speed automatic that gets fitted to a whole bunch of General Motors products, and it just 
isn't up to the task. It's just not anywhere near as good as any other modern transmission. But let's give it some. She can talk the talk, but she can also walk the walk, certainly in a straight line. Then you're not surprised about that, are you? I'm pretty sure armchair critics are still sat there much as I am in many ways going, yeah, 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 American cars have always been able to do straight lines, but can they go round bends now? Well, let's find out, shall we? Let's pick up some speed. Let's probably stop for the junction. Stopping for the junction, I think, will be wise. Let's, let's not see how good it is at going through an unsighted junction. That would be a bad idea. Pretty decent traction, I have to say. It sounds great as well. There's just nothing that sounds quite like small block Chevy engine. Now there's still quite a bit of wiggle in that chassis, even in sport mode. I'm gonna go one step further and we're gonna put it into track and see if that improves things. At the moment it's reminding me a little bit of the Mustang that I drove, which I think was a 2016, that did not have the Magna Ride fitted. And that car did this odd thing. It was simultaneously too stiff and also too soft. This is doing a little bit of that but not as much. What is actually very impressive is the steering. Did not expect that to be good at all, especially because it is something of a weak link in the Corvette's dynamics. And this actually is better than I recall the Corvette being, but do please forgive me if I'm getting that wrong because it's been a number of years since I've driven a Corvette, or at least one anyway. If anybody in the UK has got the new C8 on order and is happy for me to drive it, or indeed has a C7, I'm always, always keen to drive a Corvette, so please do drop me a line. Now, while we're sat behind this learner driver, who I'm not going to terrorise, we should talk about the price, because that's a big one. And I mean big with a capital F. This car, as it stands right now, 12,323 miles on the clock, yours for £33,950. That is a lot of car for the money. And in very typical American fashion, what it lacks in luxury, it makes up for in features. For example, I have down here a nice, decent, easy to use reversing camera. Not the height of luxury, I hear you say, aha, but how about the heated and cooled electric front seats and they're pretty comfortable too not the most supportive but i have a suspicion that somewhere in the gm performance parts catalog you will find plenty of buckets or whatever it is that you want to fit in your car the steering wheel itself is actually a very very good size too and i have to say i'm enjoying this car a lot more than i thought that i might rear visibility is a little bit compromised by the fact that that deck lid at the back is quite high now, boot space in this particular car isn't too bad. In the convertible, as you might expect, it's fairly tragic. And rear room for taller passengers is also not brilliant either. Not really the sort of car to take the family out for a long trip, especially not if the ones in the back are fully grown up. However, this car has a charm all of its own. And the thing that I'm thinking of most is not really a Mustang. I'm thinking really of something like the Vauxhall or Holden Monaro. With good reason. They share engine families and owners, of course. And this car just has an elasticity to its performance. This is, as far as I'm concerned, a much, much better engine for a performance road car than the BMW S55 that they used in the M4. It just is. It's got the flexibility. It revs high enough, six and a half grand. Yeah, not stratospheric, but trust me, as somebody that owns a Honda S2000, one of the reviest engines what has ever been, sometimes a bigger, torquier lump is better. And for a car like this, it's the right engine. <laughs> You do also have to put your foot all the way down to get everything that it has to offer, which is very nice. 
considering I'm in track mode in particular, that's a real surprise. A lot of manufacturers have this sort of insane desire to make the throttle almost binary in its response, especially in the sportier modes. And I just don't get that. I want modularity. I want to be able to tell the car exactly how much that throttle that I want. And this lets me do that. The gearbox is certainly a letdown. That is the weak link in this powertrain and indeed the entire car. Would the manual be much better? I can't honestly say because I haven't driven one. Maybe I'm being a little bit too harsh on the car and the gearbox because I've been used to so many truly brilliant setups, but in 2017, I think Chevrolet should have been able to do better. But the Camaro, when you get into a groove with it, it's a genuinely enjoyable performance car. I'm glad to have a passenger because if you want to drive one daily or around a city or something like that, being on the left-hand side of a car like this with the visibility it has, or rather doesn't have, would be a problem. But right now on this kind of road, I'm having a lot of fun. Oh, that steering, it's just precise and darty, and that I, I just don't believe. I mean, I've just got out of the 68, which is the most woolen, awful thing. I mean, if I were to turn this car as much as I had to that one, we'd be in a hedge. We'd be over there, we'd be way in the field, we'd be gone. But this thing, oh, this is proper. They should have made this in right-hand drive, as well as the C8. I mean, I want both. I'm greedy, okay? I wanted the C7 in right-hand drive. Had the C7 been available in right-hand drive, I'm pretty sure I would have been a customer, because that was a cool cookie of a car. And for a bit of a blast, and for a bit of fun, I can look past a lot of faults. I can look past the sort of slightly slow to respond screen, which is much better actually than in the previous C7 that I used. And I can look past the slightly unrefined interior, the lower quality materials that any German car owner I'm sure will sneer at and tell you how much better his is and you know, all about residual values and all this crap. But let's be perfectly honest here. This is a proper fun. M3s don't sound like that anymore. And that's a shame. I could also tell you for a bonus, when you're cruising, these engines are remarkably economical. They have cylinder deactivation, very trick, and they can run down to about four cylinders, or at least in the Corvette they can, which means that you can get surprising fuel economy. What I mean by that? Well, the last time I had a VET in the USA, I was doing over 30 to the gallon. Imperial, mind, not US. And that is a hell of an achievement. This is a very, very fun car. And if you fancy buying it at just under 34,000 pounds, that's a decision I can get on board with. I, I really, really can. This is going in the diary as one of the biggest pleasant surprises of the year. Oh, it loves that corner. We're currently staying in a place up on the North York Moors and I wish we had this there because this would absolutely love it. It's not scalpel sharp, but actually for the road, it's all the car you would ever need and a little bit more. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.